uh, one thing there was before Q and A starts properly, and we don't have so much time, so people can raise hand to have questions. But there was one question already uh, earlier from YouTube that uh, about some kind of differences. Uh, be, talking about deep sleep, is it a blankness really or not? And the other one was that um, what happens after uh, self-realization? Is there a world to be seen or how can that be? And there's there might be some different points of view according to Advaita, uh, classical Advaita and Bhagavan's teachings. Can you say something about this, uh, either one of you, Michael or, or Swamiji? Swamiji, you please go first. Uh Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, so yes, as far as I know and understand uh, classical Advaita Vedanta, um, after enlightenment realization that you are Brahman, uh, does the world continue? Do you still see a world? Uh, the answer seems to be yes. Uh, enlightenment doesn't, this is a Hindi phrase which some of the monks in Himalayas use, Gyana koi torpor nahi karta hai. Knowledge is not something that uh, destroys or changes things in the world. It reveals reality. So knowledge always reveals reality. It doesn't you know, change things, uh, uh, change reality. It reveals reality. So once you realize you are Brahman, do you still see the world? Direct practical answer, yes. If you look at the lives of uh, enlightened people, Bhagavan, Ramana Maharshi, Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, whoever you consider to be enlightened, and they still seem to have a sense of separation between themselves and others. They, they can use language just as well as the rest of us. I, you, uh, they recognize people. They know, uh, you know, everything that we can do in the world, they can also do often better. So they clearly see, hear, smell, taste, touch, they uh, remember, they think, they understand, they laugh, they enjoy, they can uh, feel bodily sensations, including pleasure and pain, all of that. So in that sense, the world continues to appear. Yet, yet, <laughs> if you would press them that, uh, so are you seeing the world? Uh, they might say, uh, you know, in common sense, yes, why not? And if you ask, really? They would say no. <laughs> there is really no world. There is really no uh, individual self. Uh, there is just that—that that one Brahman uh, appearing as all of this. The the solution to this lies. I mean, I ju I just add one thing here. There was a discussion in uh, in a class which I attended at uh, on Buddhism at Harvard Divinity School, and the bone of contention was, does the Buddha, the enlightened one, know everything or know nothing? Because the texts <laughs> seem to say both. The Buddha is omniscient and uh, the entire world is an illusion. So the Buddha cannot know anything that is illusory. Buddha only knows the truth. Therefore, the Buddha doesn't know the world. So does the Buddha know everything or does the Buddha know nothing? And the professor had a term for the Buddha. He said, is it a brainstem Buddha? That means after your enlightenment, are you reduced to a comatose state where you know nothing at all? But it's not like that. As far as I understand it, it is that you realize that one reality appearing as many. See, at, at our level, we seem to think that I am this person. Here, this body, mind, this conscious. We, we don't even deny that we are conscious. Uh, we are, but what we think is we are body, mind, and consciousness. This bundle and this very limited bundle and this very obvious, real, physical world out there. And everything else is separate from me. And this is reality for us. This is not how the enlightened persons see reality. They will still, if they have eyes, they will see. If they have ears, they're going to hear. If they have tongue, they will taste. But all of that, whatever they see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, remember, forget, enjoy, suffer, all of that is just the shining forth of one reality, which they know to be themselves in their, their own reality. That Aham Brahmasmi shining forth as all of this. What we think of as an independent, separate world and a little independent, separate self, this they would deny in their entirety. So, from this perspective, does the world continue appear after enlightenment? Yes and no. <laughs> <It doesn't. laughs> 
the uh, letter shall I also see please, please, that? Please, yeah. Um, I yes, like I, I, I would say very much the same thing. That is one thing we we have to understand with all these sort of questions and the answers given to them is very different ways of viewing these same things. When we look outwards, we see um, we see jiva muktas, jnanis, like um, Shankara, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Bhagavan Ramana. In our view, they seem to be people like us. They seem to be operating in this world, answering our questions, laughing with us, crying with us, undergoing all the emotions that we undergo. They seem to be very much like us. So from that perspective, it has to be conceded. Yes, Vanyani sees the world. But so of many of the explanations that are given are given from that perspective. But Vanyani is a person. Vanyani is a body, just like us. And then uh, if, if Vanyani is that body, they are certainly operating in this world just like us. They're seeing all the things we are seeing. But as Bhagavan clarified, the body and mind of Vijnani exist only in the view of Vijnani. Ag sorry, only in the view of the Agnani. So because we take ourselves to be a body, we take them to be a body. But their experience is quite different. They don't experience themselves with this body. What they are seeing is exactly the same as what we are seeing. But whereas we are seeing it as this world of multiplicity, they are seeing it as it actually is, which is ekameva dvaitiam, one only without a second. They are seeing it as themselves. So the answer to that question, does Buddha, um, does Buddha know everything or does Buddha know nothing? The simple answer to that question is Buddha knows the only thing. In knowing the only thing, he knows everything because there's nothing else to know. Uh, because he knows the only thing, that is, he knows what we know as all this multiplicity, he knows as the one. So uh, the truest way to say that is, Banyani is Sarvagna, all knowing, omniscient, but that, om, that all is one that he's not seeing the multiplicity, he's seeing the oneness. Whereas we see the one as many, he sees what we see as many as one, because it is actually, he sees it as it is, because he's seeing the one as one, whereas we are seeing the one as many. This is, uh, Bhagavan has, um, has expressed this very beautifully in verse 18 of Uludunapadu. Um, Generally, it is well known, Bhagavan taught that the world is unreal. But in this verse, seemingly, he's saying the world is real. He says, for those who do not have knowledge, in other words, for the Agnanis, and for those who have, in other words, the Nyanis, the world is real. For those who do not know, reality is to the extent of the world. For those who have known, reality pervades devoid of form as the as the um adara as the support as the unders as the substratum as the, the ground for the world this no but this is the difference between them so th that is what i'm saying when the Benyani is seeing exactly the same as we are seeing exactly he's seeing exactly what we are seeing but He's not seeing it as we are seeing it. He is seeing it as it is, which is one only without a second. What we, in other words, he sees the world as Brahman. We see Brahman as a world. If I may just interject. Yes. Um, Michael made a number of very important points, one of which struck me that, he, as you put it beautifully, because we see ourselves as persons, there's a body, I'm on this mind and this person, clearly, no matter how much I read and think about mm -hmm. it, I still instinctively see myself as this person. And I can't help seeing the jnani, the jivan mukta, the enlightened person as a person, because it seems to be a person. There's a body, there's a, you know, it's talking, walking. I remember uh, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, the 12th president of our order, this was years ago, decades ago, in fact. He was this very elderly Swami and the head of our order, and we used to, and a great uh, uh, learned master of Ad Advaita. 
many of us we had this intuition that he was an enlightened person so he used to pest we used to pester him with uh, questions about what is it like to be enlightened and there was one very crucial um, one thing that still remains very clear in my memory one day the swamis who were questioning swami bhuteshananda they said exactly what i was saying we see the enlightened person walking talking recognizing differences um, and you know doing everything just like everybody else uh, so how is it that that person is seeing oneness and then swami bhuteshanji he would speak in a very slow way he said that's what you see and then the questioner said yes swami but we want to know what does the enlightened one see what does that enlightened person see and his only answer immediate answer was who sees <laughs> and that through us we all were a little mystified but you know that's exactly what um, michael was saying that we have made up our minds that this personality is the only real thing that there is and this external world is the only real thing that there is we do not see that underlying reality the second thing he touched upon was this question of is the world real or not and uh, the beautiful verse he quoted that the world is real for the agyani and the world is real for the gyani but the world is real for the agyani because they see the world and that's what they think is real and the world is real for the uh, gyani because the gyani sees the underlying reality uh, if if that was the translation yeah, was yes. that the translation? exactly exactly the underlying reality the substrate and the adhara yeah. uh, which is yeah. brahman the same question was asked to sri ramakrishna and he gave a mystifying uh, reply uh, somebody asked him is the world unreal he said oh why should it be unreal that's a stage in inquiry and he kept quiet at that <laughs> so that's very interesting because they were disciples of sri ramakrishna whom we all regard as enlightened um, the you know direct disciples of sri ramakrishna the brother monks with vivekananda some of whom said the world is real uh, some of whom said the world is completely unreal <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what do you make of it it's exactly that i think is is the snake real or unreal it's unreal as a snake it's real as a rope as a rope yes <laughs> right. uh, another uh, michael can vouch for this i have quoted it sometimes but i'm not sure whether i was quoting um, ramana maharshi right is that um, did he say that it is only the enlightened person who can say that the world is real somewhere yes yes ah. so, yes i think that's something that that is only the enlightened person well even to say enlightened person is not quite correct um because they're not obviously not a person but only only they can only they know what is the meaning of saying the world is real ah that's beautiful yeah. that's beautiful yes so long as we see the world of multiplicity we have to accept it's unreal yes. when we see the underlying reality then only we can say it is real yes that's beautifully said thank you <laughs> and swamiji there was uh, there was we 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 both answered the second part of the question there were actually two questions i think you see you asked one was about sleep yes yes there was a, a, a question in youtube from youtube that um, is this deep sleep really a a blankness or something like this or is it uh wait a minute here is deep deep sleep really a blankness or or is it a pure awareness i am this was the question yes Swamiji, uh, would you like to answer that from a classical advaita perspective the blankness is not a term used by um, uh, you know the classical writers it's a term that i use the classical writers would call it a causal state or a seed state uh, the idea being all our waking and dream impressions they are collected there in the seed state and in a, or a potential state and it's a state and then it sort of blooms forth into uh, the world of waking and dreams and so on so these three states cycle back and forth um is it a state of pure awareness there is a radical school of non dualists who would say that <laughs> advaitins who will say that um, waking and dreaming are states of you know dreaming and uh, it's you know, in deep sleep that there is only the atman but um 
the interpretation that I would favor is that fear awareness is there all the time. It's there, whether it's a waking state or a dream state or a deep sleep state, these cycle back and forth, um, they are related to the mind. Um, and to some extent, when as far as the mind is related to the body, they may be related to the body. They are not related to, nor do they affect um, the pure awareness, the I am. That shines unaffected all the time. But as Michael pointed out, the only difference being is in the waking and in the dreaming, upadhis appear. Body, mind, sensory activity, and the world generated by sensory activity, they appear. And they seem to color that pure radiance of I am, but only seem to. For an enlightened person, it makes, for the enlightened one, it makes no difference. Um, in the awakened state, when the body is appearing, world is appearing, it's not that the enlightenment is clouded in any way uh, for the fully enlightened being. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, I, what I would say on that, what, what, uh, you, you referred to a radical school of Advaita Vedanta. Um, Bhagavan often spoke from that radical perspective. Bhagavan said, sleep is a state of pure awareness. That is, there's a verse in Uludunapdu, verse 26, in which he says, If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. Adalal, Yadu idu endu nadale, ovadal yabamena or. Therefore, investigating what this is, what this ego is, is giving up everything. Why he says that is everything, all phenomena, all objects, all uh, multiplicity appears only in the view of ego. So it is only when ego appears that all this multiplicity appears. When ego doesn't rise, there is no multiplicity. So ego itself is the seed that expands as all this multiplicity. Ego, just like when we're dreaming, the dreaming mind is seeing itself as a dream world. This ego is seeing itself as all this multiplicity. So there's no multiplicity without ego. Therefore, since, as he said in the previous verse, that if you investigate ego, ego will take flight investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. That is by, to the extent to which we turn our attention within, ego subsides and everything else subsides along with it. When ego finally merges back into its source, everything merges back into its source and one alone remains. So from this perspective, ego, ex ego appears in waking and dream. In sleep, there is no ego. So sleep is a state of, well, as you say, Swami, all the three, that is, pure awareness underlies all the three states. But it is like, like the screen. The pure awareness is like the screen in the cinema. Waking and dream are states in which a picture is being shown on the screen. Sleep is a state in which there's no picture. So sleep is, a, according to Bhagavan, according to this particular way of it, sometimes Bhagavan explained in other ways to suit people of different levels. But the, the purest teaching is that sleep is a state of pure awareness. What, we exp what, what shines in sleep alone, knowing itself, is only pure awareness. However, we are, in waking and dream, we are seeing sleep from the perspective of ego. Ego is a false awareness of ourself. So as ego, we don't know ourselves as we actually are. So to us, sleep appears to be a, a state of blank or blank darkness place. or something. But that's only from the perspective of ego in waking and dream. Then, as you say, Swamiji, it is also said that sleep is a karana state. The karana sarira remains in sleep. This again, this is for the purpose of explanation. For people, the question many people ask, if ego doesn't exist in waking and dream, then why does ego, uh, sorry, if ego doesn't exist in sleep, how does ego arise again in waking and dream? 
what is what causes ego to rise? So the usual explanation that is given to satisfy people is that everything remains in a seed form, as the car and the sarira in sleep, and it, it then expands. But that explanation is suitable for people of a certain level of understanding. But if we think about it more deeply, that's actually not an entirely satisfactory answer, because according to the a Buster Treyer um, analysis, we, we, we are told that that is the importance of sleep from the point of view of that analysis is in sleep, we are not aware of anything. We're, what shines in sleep is only ourself. So supposing, supposing we accept that the Karana Sarira exists in sleep, then why should we not say the Karana Sarira is what we actually are? So there, there's a slight incons logical inconsistency there. So according to Bhagavan, trying to explain why ego came into existence is like trying to explain how the son of a barren woman was born. It can never be explained. That is a question people often ask is, how did, uh, why is there Maya? How did things, how did Maya come into existence? Uh, or Maya, according to Bhagavan, is nothing but ego. So how did this ego come into existence? It cannot be explained because ego, for two reasons. Firstly, ego is the first cause. Cause and effect come into, a, come into existence only after the rising of ego. So ego is what causes everything else. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist, as Bhagavan says. So we cannot explain how or why ego came into existence. And we need not explain it because if we investigate this ego, we will find that it has never come into existence. So why should we seek an explanation for what doesn't actually exist? That's why people often, when people used to ask Bhagavan, why did, why did this ego rise in the first place? Bhagavan often used to say, okay, first you find that ego and bring it to me, and then we can find out how, how it came into existence. Yeah. If we investigate this ego, we find there's no such thing at all. So um, th this is in a way to there are so many different levels of explanation given to suit people at different levels of understanding. So if we are willing to accept that there's no explanation, and there need not be any explanation for why ego first came into existence, there also need not be any explanation for why ego came into existence, why ego rises from sleep. Because if yeah. we investigate this ego, it has never actually risen. The ultimate right. truth is that is what you, you mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the radical school of Advaita, that is the Drishti Shrishti Vada, that is what Bhagavan teaches. So according to that, none of this exists apart from our perception of it. It, it, right. There's no cre there's no Shrishti creation other right. than Drishti. So it's only in the view of ego that all these things seem to exist. So ego is the the first cause. It cannot have a, there cannot be any cause for ego. And if we investigate this ego, we find ego doesn't exist. Therefore, nothing exists. Therefore, the ultimate truth is ajata. Mm. Beautifully and powerfully stated, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question, at least from YouTube, related to putting uh, teachings into practice in practical life. Let me see. <clears throat> How to get hooked onto this investigation dealing with world, family, and responsibilities every day? So this kind of a practical question came from YouTube. Swamiji? Uh, Michael, you go first this time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um Bhagavan has given a very simple answer to this that is related to the law of karma. According to Vedanta, there are three karmas, agamya, sanchita, and prarabdha. Agamya is those actions we do under the sway of our vishaya vasanas. In other words, the actions we do according to our will. Those are the actions that bear fruit. The fruit of those actions get stored in sanchita. 
and Sanchita means a heap or pile. It's a vast heap because we've been, we, in each life, we accumulate more fruit than we experience. So Sanchita is an ever-growing pile. From that vast pile, God or Guru selects those fruit that will be most conducive to our spiritual development in this lifetime. And those fruit are allotted to us as our prarabdha, as our destiny. So everything that we are to experience in this life is predetermined. That doesn't mean our will is predetermined. We are free to, that, that is, prarabdha determines what we are to experience. Our will determines what we want to experience and what we try to experience. Because we want to experience and try to experience so many things, we are constantly generating more fruit. But whatever is to happen, what, whatever we are to experience is, is already predetermined. And in order for us to experience whatever we are destined to experience, certain actions are necessary on our part. If we, the, the, the analogy I often give is, if we are destined to become a doctor, we have to study and pass exams and everything. So since we are destined to be a doctor, we will be made to do those actions which are necessary in order for that, uh, that prarabdha to unfold. Generally, if, we, if it's our destiny to be a doctor, most people who want to become doctors, most people who become doctors want to become doctors because they think they, it's a noble profession, they'll be able to serve others, they'll be able to alleviate suffering, or they may think it's a prestigious job, it's got high social prestige, or they may think it's a means of earning money or a mixture of all these. So that actions they do in order to become a doctor is driven both by God in accordance with their prarabdha, both by the will of God in accordance with their prarabdha and by their own will. So sometimes our will and God's will happens to coincide. Not always, unfortunately. Our will is um, generally uh, uh, giving us a lot of trouble, but uh, sometimes it happens to coincide. But, but, but how this is applicable here is Supposing we have a family, supposing we're married and we've got 10 children, we've got a, a job, we have to work 10 hours a day, seven days a week. Does, is that an obstacle for spiritual progress? No, it is not. Because all those actions that are necessary for us to support our, if we are destined to have a family and to support our family, our mind, speech, and body will be made, made to do these things. So, as Bhagavan says, however much burden one places on God, he will bear all of it. He says this in the 13th paragraph of Nana. Uh, in the previous sentence, he defines what is self investment, what is self surrender. He says, being Atmanishta Param, one who is firmly established with oneself, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any thought other than atma chintana, other than self-attentiveness, so that is atma vichara, uh, is giving oneself to God. That is, if we are so keenly attending to ourselves, if we attend to ourselves so keenly, there will be no room for other thoughts to arise, because other thoughts can arise only if we attend to them. If we are not aware of them, they can't arise. So if we are attending to ourselves so keenly, there will be no room for other thoughts to arise. Thereby we remain as Atmanishta Param, one who is firmly established as oneself, and that is giving ourselves to God. Then he says in the next sentence, however much burden is placed on God, he bears all of it. That means even the burden of thinking we can leave to him. That is the actions of our mind, speech, and body, but are necessary for our prarabdha to unfold. He will make them do those actions. Any other, any other actions are driven only by our will. Those we, if we are, if we are surrendered to Him, we won't be acting according to our will. We will only be subsided within. So, but if we are truly following the spiritual path of going within more and more and more. Our mind, speech, and body will be made to do these whatever actions are necessary to support our family, to, to fulfill our responsibilities and work at everything. So the spiritual path, by going within, we are separating ourselves from this person we now seem to be. So this person has a certain destiny and will be made to act in accordance with that destiny. 
we separate ourselves by going within. So there's no whether our destiny, if it's our destiny, we will be a sannyasi. If it's our destiny, we will be a householder. All these things come according to destiny. But this destiny cannot, we, we, we may be living in a cave, but Bhagavan used to say, if you cannot hold on to self-attentiveness in the midst of a battlefield, you will not be able to hold on to self-attentiveness, even, even when sitting in a cave in the Himalayas. Because the problem is not the, what's happening around you. It's the mind's, the vishaya vasana, the inclination of the mind to go outwards and grasp all these vishayas. So the problem doesn't lie in the external life. The prar whatever prarabdha we're given is what is most conducive to our spiritual development. It's, and Bhagavan also said, prarabdha affects only the outward going mind. It can never obstruct the mind from going within. Samiji, would you like to um, no, add I, to that? I think those are a very beautiful set of instructions. First, the circumstances of householder life are not a really an obstruction to spiritual uh, attainment. As you said, um, Vedanta believes that whatever is set up in this life as a householder or as a monk uh, is um, ultimately meant for our spiritual evolution. So it can't be an obstruction to spirituality. Um, I mean, why does Vedanta believe this? Because the Vedantic view of life itself is life, universe, cosmos, our individual existence, life after life, all of this, the entire game is supposed to be to take us towards eventual enlightenment and freedom. So this is the paradigm that is given in Vedanta. Therefore, from that perspective, householder life is not an uh, uh, obstruction uh, to uh, enlightenment. Uh, I remember instructions or even scoldings given to us by senior monks when we as young monastic novices, after leaving the world and becoming young monks, one of the prime complaints we had was, oh, there's too much work in the ashram. We don't have enough time for a spiritual practice. And the scoldings we would get is that uh, there is ample time uh, and scope for spiritual practice. If you're honest to yourself, you will see how much time, energy uh, we are uh, wasting in useless thought and talk and action. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> the problem lies in us, not out there. <laughs> not out there. <laughs> yeah. We are the problem and we are the solution. Yes. <laughs> Uh, one more, one more question came from YouTube. Um, does falsity of the world happen only when one experiences pain, sorrow, that also change? So, with what response, respect, world is false. So, I think this is about if we experience pain. Does the falsity of the world only happen when one experiences pain and sorrow? That's the question i think so i think i think it yeah. was answered a bit i think so um uh, my, my reaction to that would be that uh, sri ramakrishna used to sometimes call it markat vairagya that is a monkey dispassion so uh, they, a temporary shock may ensue if there is a uh, some kind of a loss or some kind of a shock coming from the world so a temporary uh, renunciation might come into the mind. Um, but unless one, there's a genuine spiritual seeking which is already developed, what happens is that a sense of falsity of the world, temp uh, unreality or temporariness of the world comes for a while and then it again disappears and people go back to living the way they were living. Um, so that is not what is meant by the falsity of the world in Advaita Vedanta. It is not uh, occasioned by a, a like a bitter experience. And there is in the Upanishads a very beautiful uh, analogy of two birds on a tree, uh, and the higher bird and the lower bird. The higher bird just sits and watches, and the lower bird, bird lower on the tree, hops from branch to branch and pecks at this fruit and that fruit, and occasionally it pecks at an exceptionally bitter fruit and gets a shock and looks at the higher bird 
and decides not to taste these fruits anymore and go straight towards the higher bird. But on its way up, it gets distracted by a particularly nice looking fruit and it pecks that and it's sweet and tasty and it forgets the higher bird until again it gets the shock. So that's the value of um, these kicks and blows that we get in life. It's just to awaken us to the inherent limit, limited nature of um, worldly experiences, uh, money, pleasure, achievement, even worldly knowledge. Um, they are all right by themselves, but they cannot satisfy the urge for the infinite that we have within ourselves. Um, from the perspective of the underlying reality, from the perspective of Brahman, the world is not a second separate individual reality, the way we tend to, um, to treat it. That is what's meant by the unreality of the world from, in a, from a philosophical sense. Yeah, but that um, that Bairagya you refer to in Tamil, that is called Smasana Bairagya. Smasana. <laughs> yes, Sri Ramakrishna also used to call it Smasana Bairagya. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Bairagya yeah. of the cremation yeah. ground. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> when you go to the cremation ground and see your dear friend being cremated, for a little while you get Bairagya. Oh, what is this world and everything? But very quickly you forget and you return to all your worldly pursuits and aspirations and everything. I would also add one thing to that, that is when we talk about the falseness or unreality of the world or the reality, what actually in Vedanta, in Advaita, is meant by real or unreal? Bhagavan has clarified what is real is what actually exists. What is anything that doesn't actually exist, even if it seems to exist, it is unreal. So if we take that as the as the standard, what actually exists must always exist, as Bhagavan said. And, and it's also said in the Bhagavad Gita, verse 16, 16. of chapter two. Chapter two. Yes. Yeah. That is what whatever does not exist always is not intrinsically existent. It is borrowing its existence from something else. So this world is not intrinsically existent. It appears and it disappears. From where does this world borrow its, uh, its semi-existence? It borrows its semi-existence from us as ego. And even this ego is not is, is only a semi-existence. It doesn't actually exist because it doesn't always exist. So from what does ego borrow its, or yeah, from what does it derive or borrow its, its semi-existence? It borrows its existence from the real existence of ourself. That is, what actually exists is Brahman, the pure awareness I am. Ego is the adjunct completed awareness, I am this body. So. Ego seems to be real because of this element of I am in it. So why, do, why, what is actually real is only I am. Because I take this body to be myself, this body seems to me to be real. And since this body is a part of this world, the whole world seems to be real. But what is actually real is only I am. So when it is said everything is uh, um, mitya or asatya or unreal, uh, false, what it means is, though it seems to exist, it doesn't actually exist. It has no intrinsic existence. It's borrowing its semi-existence from something else. So all objects borrow their semi-existence from the subject. In other words, the phenomena borrow their semi-existence from ego, and ego borrows its semi-existence from the one real existence, such at our own being. I would just like to add here uh, what Michael is saying and also the Advaitic teachings which we study from the texts. What, what is expected is don't take them as teachings. You know, take them as fact and try to notice them in your own experience yep. right away. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like Oh, these are very high uh, spiritual experiences. One day maybe we'll have them. The spiritual masters have had these experiences and they're telling us, no, no, they are not extraordinary experiences. They are uh, the description of reality as best as these masters could convey to us in speech. It, it's, it's right here. That's, for example, when we say real or unreal, just stop there, slow down 
and consider the sense of reality which we have right now, very soon you'll begin to see it's, it's not what we thought it was in our unthinking state that, oh, here is a world which is real. No, you very, big, very soon begin to see the sense of reality belongs to me, not to the world. Mm -hmm. And the world sort of leeches or stands upon the sense of reality borrowed from you. Notice that this right now seems real. It's undeniable, it feels real. But the moment it passes away in time into memory, it's like memory and imagination are not very different from each other. And they seem vague and unreal. And the new instant seems real. Now, it's not that the world is real every new instant and becoming unreal in the past. Not even that time is real. Rather, it whatever you are, wherever you are, that seems real. Notice how dreams seem real when you are dreaming. Not because the dreams are real. It's because you are there. This waking seems real right now. It's because you are there. And then, of course, Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi gives a more detailed analysis. There's one step in between. It's not directly the pure self. It's the ego. So the reality is borrowed from the ego and then the ego, as Michael has shown, that also can be tracked And if in our own experience. And if we track it in our own experience, try to notice it step by step, uh, it's the doorway to enlightenment. Exactly. That is the practice. That is the practice. <laughs> Otherwise, the tendency is that uh, these are great, uh, but now tell me something I can do to get, get these experiences. <laughs> no, B Bhagavan is telling us, Advaita is telling us what we are going to be supposed to do. We are not listening. <laughs> We immediately classify them as oh extraordinary things which will happen maybe at the end of my life or in some future life. But now what do I need to do? We need to do exactly this. Yeah. <laughs> but regarding doing, Bhagavan clarified another thing. That is, attending to anything other than ourself is a doing. Because it's a movement of our mind or attention away from ourself towards something else. Yeah. But attending to ourself is not a doing, it is a cessation of doing. Because to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to our own being, ego thereby subsides, all doing comes to an end, and being alone remains. Being is the practice, but that the, the doorway to that being, the doorway to remaining as we actually are, is by holding on to self-attentiveness, by directing our attention inwards. Yes. Yes. Fix the mind in oneself and do not think of anything else. Anything else. To the extent to which we fix our attention on ourselves, to that extent we subside and remain in our natural state of summa irupadu, just being. There's this story I heard from a monk that uh, as a young kid he used to visit any monk he ever found on you know near their village on the bank of the ganges um, and once he went to this uh, monk who was visiting was passing through their village and he asked this monk he would ask them give me some advice some practice what do i do so this young boy who later became a monk he he asked this unknown master asked him what do i do and uh, the master said can you do one thing he said what do nothing I said, <laughs> and then this boy said and then he was taken aback what do you mean do nothing he said by doing so much has already happened <laughs> if you do more it'll keep on increasing uh, can you stop doing and then the boy was a little confused and he said no i don't think i can and then uh, the master said if you can't stop doing well the second best is here are certain good practices to do <laughs> Uh, there's time limits. It's uh, we have a, about twelve minutes or so. So there's one more question came from um, again from YouTube that uh, if all is Brahman and Brahman is pure, uh, how can it manifest as evil in some? This kind of question. Samiji, would, would you like to say? Okay. Um, it's like. You know, take the movie example. You can, on the same screen, 
same pure screen, in the sense, pure in the sense contentless. Uh, you can have a horror a movie, a comedy, a tragedy. In some movie, there can be terribly evil people doing terribly evil things. In some movie, there can be good things, funny things also. Uh, and uh, uh, the answer would be that uh, if the screen is pure, how can it do awful things? The answer would be that what if you ask the screen, what would the screen say? I didn't. I, I, I was never awful. You are accusing me of crimes that I never committed. But it made possible the appearance of all things. Um, so I think this question arises, first of all, from a slight um, misunderstanding of the term pure. Um, people think pure means a good person. But pure, um, shuddha brahma, it means... Um, existence itself or awareness itself now awareness itself or existence itself when it is reflected in a body mind it just illumines and appears to give existence to whatever is contained in that mind body system and the mind has seeds of endless um, chain of births uh, existences some of which are nasty, some of which may be good, some of which may be the nasty parts may be manifesting in this particular life. Those two are equally, they seem to be given existence by Brahman, seem to be illuminate, uh, illumined by consciousness. That doesn't mean Brahman or consciousness is affected by the so-called goodness or nastiness of, of, the, um, of the personality. It's like the sunlight shining on Ganga water and ditch water um, the Ganga water is supposed to be pu is pure and the ditch water is supposed to be dirty the sunlight is not purified by the Ganga water the sunlight is not made impure by the uh, di ditch water um, what appears at the level of manifestation remember the language is manifestation it's not ultimate reality so the ultimate reality of Brahman is not affected by um, the good or evil in, in the at the level of this world would you like to yes um one thing i i'll say on that that is in the upanishads it is said all this is brahman bhagavan has said all this is ego that's in verse 26 of ego of he says ego itself is everything so is there a contradiction here no there is not that is everything is ego because everything is it, it is all this is it, it is all projected from the ego is the seed from which all this sprouts so in that sense everything is ego so everything exists only in the view of ego nothing has any existence independent of ego and this ego if this ego investigates itself to know its own reality it will find itself to be nothing but Brahman. In other words, it's not ego, it is only Brahman. And of course, what finds itself to be Brahman is not ego, it is only, I mean, when, e when ego investigates itself, it dissolves back into its source and Brahman alone remains shining. So the reality of ego is Brahman. So the, the world is nothing but ego and ego is nothing but Brahman. So the uh, world is nothing but Brahman, ultimately. But this important middle step is their ego. So the good and evil arises only from ego. It is not arising directly from Brahman. From Brahman, e ego seems to have arisen. From ego, good and evil arise. And good and evil, what good and evil are value judgments. We say this is good, that is bad. What is it that determines what is good or what is bad? Ultimately, if we analyze it, it's our, only our own likes and dislikes. The things we like, we say are good. The things we dislike, we say are bad. So um, we like peace. We don't like war. So war, peace is good. War is bad. We like health. We don't like disease. So disease, health is good. Disease is bad. We like to live because we we take this body to be ourselves so we want to we we, we want to uh, continue living in this body because we, we are so uh, strongly identified with this body so life is good death is bad all these value judgments arise out of egos likes and dislikes 
And as Bhagavan says, likes and dislikes are both to be disliked. So, so, so long as we rise as ego, it is inevitable that we have likes and dislikes. We, we, identify, we take ourselves to be a body. This body needs food, um, cl clothing, water, air, and all these things. So if we get these things, that is good. If we are deprived of these things, it's bad. In inevitably, we will have likes and dislikes. We, we all like to eat because eating is a means of surviving. We like to breathe because if we don't breathe, we're going to die. So like, it is impossible to rise as ego and be completely free of likes and dislikes. We can, we can and we need to reduce the strength of our likes and dislikes as much as possible, but we cannot be free of likes and dislikes so long as we rise as ego. So in order to be completely free of likes and dislikes, in order to have perfect vairagya, in order to be completely free of desire, fear, hopes, dislikes, everything, we need to be free of ego. So ultimately, the whole problem comes back to ego. So the, the, the source of both good and evil is ego. Get rid of ego, and then we go beyond this duality of good and bad. And we, what lies beyond this duality of good and bad, that is the ultimate good, which is what alone exists, the, the, the one only without a second. And I'd like to add there is, uh, that uh, none of this is, you know, the usual charge of escapism and avoiding evil. It's not that at all. In fact, uh, uh, wherever, uh, the good example is these uh, enlightened ones. So wherever they saw suffering, which came directly in, in front of them, they did their best to, to remove that suffering, to be as kind, as, as generous, um, and as helpful and as self-sacrificing as possible, more than most other ordinary people uh, would, would ever dream of doing. So, yes, if there is evil, the answer is try to remove and reduce the scope of evil. But you will always notice that you cannot do it at the worldly level from an ego level um, because uh, it will continuously generate raga dvesha and uh, this distinction between you know, worldly evil and worldly good will always remain. That's why the deep solution will have to be spirituality. That's why a real answer to this question of evil will be practical level, fight evil and suffering. And the deeper level is to attain self-enlightenment, this attentiveness to what we truly are, to understand what is the, like the Buddha, to understand the nature of sorrow. Why is there sorrow? Is there a possibility of going beyond sorrow? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's almost two hours gone. What do you think? Should we end or do we have time to continue anymore? Is there a question from the... the um, there's Zoom? one. Yes, there's one question related to, to ego came earlier that um, can the ego have its own will if it, it, if it doesn't actually exist, Michael was speaking about the individual will existing apart from God's will and only at times being in harmony with the latter. So can the ego have its own will if it, if it um, doesn't actually exist? This was the question put. Would you Can like I to answer? answer? That, or Swamiji, would you like to answer that? I'll just add, um, interject this one point here from the perspective of classical Vedanta. It's not so much that the ego doesn't exist. It's rather, uh, we are not the ego. We are not, what the illusion is, I am, I, that I am I, that's all. This is what Advaita Vedanta uh, objects to and says that you, that is exactly wrong. <laughs> when Shankaracharya sings, Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory, I am not the I. Literally, I am not I. That sounds self-contradictory, but it's not. Uh, so, um, so, from an Advaitic or even Sankhyan perspective, the ego ex exists as much as the mind does, the body does. In fact, um, th there's a definition of the ego. Abhiman Atmika Antakkaranavritti. The appropriating function of the mind is called ego. 
So there are a lot of things are going on in the body, in the mind, and you need something to tie it together into one personality. So one, the mind provides a, a, a function called, like you, know, you have apps in phones these days, a function, an app called ego. And that's perfectly um, harmless until we say that we forget our real nature as limitless awareness and that's what we are. And we don't even see that how we get entangled in that. So, so that's the point I, I wanted to, uh, because otherwise there's always the danger of thinking that, uh, um, so the body exists, the world exists, the mind exists, everything exists except the, and Brahman exists, only the ego doesn't exist. No, uh, e even ego exists, but in the sense of uh, just the functioning of the mind. Uh, yes, that is when Bhagavan says ego doesn't exist, he means ego doesn't actually exist, but ego certainly seems to exist because it is only in the view of ego that all these other things exist. Without ego, as Bhagavan says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Without e If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist because everything, the whole world, exists only in the view of ego. <clears throat> so ego Though ego doesn't actually exist, it seems to exist, and it seems to experience all this. It seems to have likes and dislikes and everything. So ego certainly does have a will of its own. The, the will of the ego is obviously no more real than ego. Ego is ultimately unreal, but it seems to exist. <clears throat> and also regarding what you were saying, uh, um, about you quoting Shankara, why he says ego is not I, <clears throat> because ego is, that is, e there are two elements that form ego, chit and jada, the chit jada granti. It is the not formed by the entanglement of these two. <clears throat> the, that, that, that conflation, that conflated mixture of chit and jada, that is not what we actually are. What we actually are is only the chit element of ego. So, in order to know ourselves as we actually are, we need to separate ourselves from the Jada element. How do we separate ourselves from the Jada element? The Jada element means body, mind, and all, all these uh, panchakosha, the five sheaths. How do we separate ourselves from them? <clears throat> these five sheaths are not holding on to us. We are holding on to them. We means we as ego are holding on to them. If instead of holding them, if we try to hold our own being, if we try to hold that fundamental awareness I am, to the extent to which we hold on to I am, we are thereby letting go of the upadis. So the upadis, the adjuncts will slip off and the pure I am alone will remain. That pure I am is not ego, but the ego is that pure I am mixed and conflated with adjuncts. The, the pure I am is... Uh, is what always exists, whether the adjuncts are there or not, the pure I am is always there. But so long as we rise as ego, we're grasping the adjuncts and we, 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 this, the resulting mixture is unreal. The resulting mixture is not what we actually are. What we actually are is only the essential chit aspect of ego. In other words, the pure awareness I am. Can I ask a question or yes. is it too late? No, certainly. no, no, go ahead, please. Okay. I have always been fascinated by the uh, pictures of uh, Bhagavan. Yes. And the photographs, for example, the one which you have here. And, yes. um, when you talk about meditation, is it a good practice to just focus on the face, the actual picture, just to focus on the face of Bhagavan, the expression in the eyes? You know, after studying Vedanta and all of that, would it would it have a uh, um, like a breakthrough impact on the on the psyche? You know, like uh, I don't know if I can phrase this better. I I would say yes, certainly, because we cannot look at the face of Bhagavan without remembering what. Why did why did Lord Shiva appear in this particular name and form. It was for one purpose and one purpose alone, to teach this path of Atma Vichara, to teach this path of looking within. So by looking at his eyes, his eyes are, draw our attention back towards ourselves. Yes. 
exactly the same. Bhagav Bhagavan, there's a verse in Arunachala Patikam, verse uh, 10, in which Bhagavan, uh, I, I think Swamiji, you may be aware there's a, um, there's a saying, by being born in, um, uh, in Aprasadasi, that's Tiruvaro, by seeing Chidambaram, by dying in Kasi, or by mere thought of Arunachala, liberation is assured. So Bhagavan explains in this verse 10, how this thought of Arunachala, and what he says about thought of Arunachala is equally applicable to him. thought about him, meditating on him, because Bhagavan is Arunachala in human form, Arunachala is Bhagavan in hill form, they are one and the same. So what Bhagavan says is, he, he said in that verse, he says, I have seen a wonder, this magnetic hill that forcibly attracts the soul. But um, uh, uh, by making, sorry, I'm not saying the exact verse, by making one think of, uh, of it, it, uh, or, no, sorry, I'll try and say it. Um, uh, um, subduing the chestse, the, the, the mischievous mental activity of those who have thought of it even once, it, it subdues their mischievous activity, it draws them within to face itself, it, 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 uh, to face itself, and thereby makes it motionless like itself. Um, it, 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 they draws it in to face itself for one. So itself for one implies that it, the drawing within, because ultimately the one is only, it, it, it's, it's, he's not talking about one thing meditating on another thing. We start off by meditating on the form of Arunachala, but that thought of Arunachala draws our attention back within to the one, because Arunachala is actually shining in our heart as I. So by subduing our mischievous mental activity, he draws us back within to face himself as he actually is, thereby he makes us motionless like himself, actualum, like himself, and he feeds upon that sweet soul, that ripened soul. He, he takes that ripened soul as bali, as the sacrificial offering. Yes. And therefore he ends that verse, O souls, be saved by thinking of this great hill, which shines in the heart as the destroyer of the soul. Mm. So what he says about Arunachala, is equally applicable about him. The that human is, form. Yes. His human name and form has that power to turn our attention back within and to, to draw us within. He often used to say about grace, grace works both from inside and outside. From within it pulls within, from outside it pushes within. So all the, everything we experience in this life, all the blows and the joys and the sorrows of life, all these ultimately are pushing us within, within, and from within, he's pulling us within. Beautifully put, yes. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank, thank you so much, Samiki. It's been very, very great joy to speak with you. <laughs>